Um, we'll get started. Uh, welcome. My name is Pollock. I'm the president of the AHPBA. And on behalf of myself, our wonderful association, and our guest speakers tonight, we would like to welcome you to another webinar in our series of webinars that we've been having together um, over the last number of months during this time apart from one another. I hope everyone is continuing to do uh, well, both mentally and physically, as we continue to uh, grapple with uh, COVID-19. Tonight, I'm very, very happy that we have such a wonderful group of individuals to discuss some very interesting uh, topics and cases. I'm particularly excited tonight because we are featuring our non-university AHPBA members. Our AHPBA association is wonderful for so many reasons. And one reason is the diversity within our ranks. And we have many, many members who are not necessarily affiliated with a traditional university um, large academic medical center. Yet these individuals deliver some of the best care and see some of the most complex patients among any of us. And it's extremely important tonight to focus on this group of our membership and to hear from them and to have them share with us their practice experience. So tonight I'd like to uh, welcome and thank Dr. Rohan Jayaraja, Dr. Ellen Hagopian, and Dr. Christos uh, Galenopoulos uh, for moderating this session. And in particular, I would like to give a particular shout out to Rohan who really uh, took the lead in organizing this uh, session. And for those of you who know him, um, they, you know how passionate Rohan is. And this is something that he embraced with all of his passion and really put together a wonderful agenda tonight. So with that, I will turn things over to Rohan and I very much look forward to uh, participating. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Tim. And uh, let me welcome everyone in just a few ground rules. We've got this in four different sections. We're gonna start out with sort of a fireside chat of some of the challenges and fun things and some of the challenges of, of the, the private practice environment. I wanna thank Ellen Hagopian and Christos Galanopoulos. And we have our panelists, Kerry Simo from ProMedica Health, Kevin Lowe from Carl Foundation Hospital and Naaman Ali from Akron General Hospital. So without further ado, let's uh, go ahead and start. So let me ask our three panelists uh, to describe just very briefly what sort of environment that you're in right now and how can it be described as not a traditional academic practice? So Naaman, why don't we start with you? Hi everyone. Um, so I'm at uh, Cleveland Clinic Akron General. Um, when I started here, we were an independent community hospital. We got bought up by or acquired by the Cleveland Clinic about two, three years ago for it. So we we're about a 350 bed uh, community hospital. Um, we're a level one trauma center though. So we're kind of a hybrid sort of mix of community. We do have an affiliation with two medical schools uh, for it too. So it's kind of a hybrid practice, but we have a very local uh, catchment area that we get here in Akron and basically be between us and the, uh, the next major cities are pretty far distance. So that's kind of how we got busy pretty quickly. It was just a, a huge catchment area. But but just to be clear, you're really in sort of a private group setting, yeah. right? Yeah, so like I'm within, we're in the Cleveland Clinic system, but our hospital is different in that I'm private practice. So I'm still compensation based, I'm RVU based versus the other Cleveland Clinic employees are salaried uh, for it too. So we have about 200 physicians in our private group and we basically just work with the hospital that I'm at right now. Okay, right. thank you so, so much. And before I forget, I do want to shout out to Medtronic. Thank you so much for sponsoring this. This has been really awesome and thank you very much for doing that. Kerry Simo, tell us a little bit about where you are and, and, and what sort of environment you're, you're in. Sure. Um, so I am uh, employed as a, uh, as a uh, surgeon, HPB surgeon for the ProMedica healthcare system. Um, but I'm really the only fellowship trained HPB surgeon in Toledo, Ohio. And um, it's sort of, uh, you know, even though I'm employed, it's almost like a private practice in the fact that I work with um, the one small uh, hospital in town that's now just been bought by McLaren that's part of their health system. And then also the Mercy Health System has the, is the other main competitor. And UTMC, which is actually the academic hospital for um, the city has actually entered in during my 
seven, almost eight years here into an affiliation with, um, with ProMedica. So I really uh, entered this with no residents and um, ended up um, kind of transitioning somewhat into having residents from that one, uh, from that program. And then actually Mercy has a surgery residency program and in trying to uh, work with them and coordinate and trying to keep more cases in town and educate their residents, um, I actually have them rotate with me at, um, at, the, at St. Luke's at the other hospital that I uh, do my work at. Fantastic, thank you, Carrie. And Kevin Lowe, last but not, lot, not least. So I'm, I work for a large hospital system in the Midwest and Champaign-Urbana. They, um, have a num number of outlying hospitals. We cover really a huge catchment area. Um, and I'm in a large private group that, uh, that employs basically all of the physicians that work in this, in this system. I do have, I have a 0.8 clinical salary and a 0.2 education uh, salary. Um, but I'm uh, involved with the, both the residency, there's four per year residency and uh, uh, medical school. It just started, so it's, Thank you. That's that's really helpful. Let me hand over to Ellen for our next set of questions. Thank you, Ellen. Oh, thank you so much, Rohan. This is such a delight to be here with all of you. And hi, everybody. <laughs> so I want to start with um, with Dr. S uh, Simo. Um, yes. Tell me, when you first started your practice, what were some of the biggest challenges that you encountered in building that, because you really built that from scratch. From the so ground. Talk about yes. your biggest challenges. Yes. So, um, you know, my challenges were really uh, one um, sort of just even educating a lot of the physicians, both in the primary care practice as well as. Um, you know, the, the GI docs and the medical oncologist and just changing some of the practice patterns that were uh, set. And, um, you know, you sort of had one set that I kind of worked with and, you know, people kind of see how your results are and how the patients like you and, you know, how you respond to them. And then, um, you know, it um, just kind of ballooned out from that um, to, you know, I never thought that I would have, um, you know, three or four different um, meta on groups, three or four different, uh, you know, US guys, GI guys, um, you know, referring, and then to really uh, talk to the primary care docs on a different level that sometimes I actually, you know, uh, serve the sort of the default of being a hepatologist, kind of. <laughs> Um, but we all, right? <laughs> right. And, um, <laughs> you know, most of the time, you know, that's fine. And it actually helps out with our GI group because they're a little shorthanded because they're so busy with procedures. But, you know, sometimes you get one and you're like, uh, this really needs a GI doc, not me. Um, so that was kind of one of the things encountering was changing some of that. Um, you know, I mean, I had one guy that was complicated, for example, with a, uh, a pancreatitis with a, you know, with a uh, really bad, uh, you know, pancreatic of pleural fistula. And as I came out of the room, as I was getting ready to take him down to the operating room, the, the, I, the, uh, you know, the critical care doc says, I was just telling my residents how most of these patients die. What is your plan with him? And I'm like, well, <laughs> take him to the OR. So um, just a lot of teaching of stuff like that. Um, you know, a lot of intense training in the operating room because they weren't used to doing those kind of complexity of cases. Um, I was fortunate to have a PA that was actually very well skilled sort of sitting in my office whenever I arrived waiting to do fun stuff. Um, so that was uh, kind of, uh, you know, that was fortunate. But um, I think that um, that was really how it all started with um, making all those initial contacts. And then kind of once they figured that out more, you know, they all talk amongst themselves and then um, it just kind of took off from there. Yeah, what, yeah. So building those those relationships are also uh, so important, and 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 I like how Rohan chatted in. I have to manage ascites. I was like, that was me when I yes. first <laughs> practice, right? It's like <laughs> so. So, Doctor Lowe, how about you? What so you know, as I think back over the ten years I've been out, I think all of the things that Doctor Simo talked about are, are really important. And 
take there's a learning curve to, to sort of discovering how you're going to navigate all that. But I found honestly that the biggest challenge has been uh, uh, identifying or, or getting a feel for the culture that you're you're in. And um, what I what I mean is there's really a a, a big um, spectrum between, especially among surgeons, but among all cancer care physicians, between those that are are sort of motivated by doing the maximum amount of work in the minimum amount of time, and and perhaps motivated by uh, RVUs, sometimes necessarily motivated by RVUs, and those of us that maybe have a, have a more traditional um, uh, um, perspective on, on on our you know on our on our careers, and and so you know I found myself honestly in a in a situation where um, there was a lot of competition for RVUs, and there was there was a lot of um, uh, fear fear of risk, and even uh, sort of uh, 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 self-protection from any time uh, um, anything was was complicated and so that those I think those kind of situations are out there and it's really easy to come out of fellowship and find yourself in this maybe this environment that's not quite ready for complex compatibility surgery uh, and that that can really be a death a death nail um, I think there's a lot to unpack there and how you sort of sort out you know that kind of culture but that really can be uh, can be scary and, you know, I'll tell you, if I could see everyone who is out there, they're probably all doing this. Yeah. Listening to yes. you, honestly, Kevin. What about you, Dr. Ali? I think Something the, uh, challenge. the mm -hmm. biggest challenge I think I found was, I mean, I came straight here from fellowship from, you know, I was at the Cleveland Clinic main campus. So it's like, I need an EUS. So I put the order in Epic for an EUS and it happens the next day. Or I have them see a hepatologist and that happens the next day. Versus I come here and there's no one that does a US. I became the hepatologist for a good six to eight months, even now. Um, I didn't know that how to do all this stuff. I, the first day I showed up in my office, my MA started the day before I did. She had no idea what she was doing. She was on a folding card table. I'm in like the breast center because they didn't give me an office when I first started. And I said, okay, I have a patient <laughs> who has cancer who needs a Whipple. I know how to do the surgery. I just don't know how to get her to the operating room to do that and get paid for it. And so that was like the biggest hurdle was just kind of transitioning from going from a training, training, you know, big centers to basically doing everything. And I think not realizing all the stuff I have to do, all the phone calls, all the things I, all the things you have to do yourself in private practice, which I guess you get used to doing, but that's been the biggest hurdle is getting used to all that. I mean, I'm still like, you know, doing charts after hours and stuff too. So yeah, that's I'm great. Expert at it right now. That's great. So culture, resources and networking, big challenges. So I'm going to pass it over to Christos. Um, Thanks, Ellen. Yeah. Great. Uh, great discussion. And of course, my head was bobbing the whole time because everything you just talked about the only thing I didn't hear was that I also play psychiatrist part-time to many people. Uh, but, you know, when we come into this world, you know, as hepatobiliary surgeons and, and we start doing these high-level cases and these complex cases, and it's great to hear that everybody struggled with resources. Uh, you know, you have to go somewhere for those resources, right? You either go to a hospital administrator, one of your partners, maybe you got to tell your group that, hey, I don't want to take ER call and do appies at night, um, that you need to be fresh in the morning for these big cases. So I'm gonna start around across and maybe we'll start with Carrie. How did you and who did you go to prove your value, right? You're not a general surgeon, right? you're not a, a hepatologist, but you're going saying, hey, I need an operating room. I need access to an ICU that's stable. I need a team to help you with these Whipples. I need EUS, I need uh, you know, a good IR. How did you prove that or did you even have to do that where you started? Um, well, some of it I did, some of it I didn't. Some of it I had asked questions and was part of why I ended up taking the job. Um, I was fortunate that the guy I had briefly joined whenever I came here had already blocked the ER call. So I never took general surgery call. Um, and then pretty much um, the way Prometica is, is done, there's a physician group and that is sort of in charge of all the employed physicians. And um, they work in conjunctions with the hospitals. And that is mainly who I've gone to is that vice pre or that president and the uh, chief medical officer. And those are the people I've had the most, uh, the most uh, success mm -hmm. with. Uh, How about getting you? Great. How about you, Kevin? 
Yeah, so I, I can contrast a previous job with this job. The, in the previous job, my value was really just to the administration who identified that they were losing a lot of these patients. What I failed to, to appreciate fully was that all the rest of the cancer physicians were were not employed. And so they saw my my existence as a threat. And that of course is a really dangerous situation to walk into. You know, they they so so the radiation oncologists, medical oncologists all had their independent practices that they felt were were at, at risk. And I was sort of the representative of that for for them. So that became really difficult because the hospital still had to maintain a relationship with them. They couldn't didn't have any real um, leverage to force them to behave in any certain way. And so, so my attempts at, at improving practice patterns were really just, you know, that I said, no, look, we'll do better, you know, we'll do better if we do it the right way and the wrong way and rather than the wrong way versus where I am now, um, everyone's, everyone's employed, er, er, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm employed by the cancer center. And so we're all working toward the same common goals, programmatic goals. And importantly, this is, this is just me perhaps, but importantly, um, we have a residency program. It's a, pri it's a private environment, but we have a residency program. And for, for those residents to graduate, they have to have the HPB um, cases. And so that makes you important in a way that I underestimated, important to the, to the system because they want those residents to, to graduate. So I think it's, it's identifying, again, there's a lot there to, to think about, but it's identifying ultimately how you have value and whether or not the, the people you're working with are going to recognize that value or whether it's in their interest to support you. Right, right. Dr. Arley? I mean, I guess the, the people I've relied on to build it is, I mean, my chairman was a big influence on it to see. I mean, he was an endocrine general surgeon, but um, you know, he's one of those guys, well, we used to do all this stuff back in the day, but then we got out of it um, for it too. So kind of relying on him and basically him giving the blessing to do these things here. And then that kind of grew from there in terms of the medical oncologists were like, oh, you do this stuff here. And then um, our physician group head in terms of marketing and getting, you know, I didn't know, I had no idea what I needed really to start a practice. So just kind of every time I realized I didn't have it, I kept a list of post-it notes on my computer of like, okay, I need to get a nurse practitioner. Okay. We need to find a dietitian. And so, as, and thankfully the system I've been at has never said no to anything um, really you know, major, except our XI, we haven't got an XI yet, but, um, the, uh, big, I know, uh, but most things they've been on board with it because we've proven the value to the system and to the community for it too. So it's just kind of been a piecemeal sort of asking administration, you know, knowing what we need at this right time and kind of getting away with it too. But it's been a blessing that I've been at, been able to get what I needed. Great, great. Thank you so much for that, Christos. That's really wonderful questions. We've got, I just got about five minutes because I really want to stick to time. I think we could have taken this whole time up with this discussion. I mean, it's so, so interesting to me. I want to ask you something really tough because this has been an issue for me over the years. And I think maybe some of you would resonate with this. And this is, you know, the peer review process in, the, in private practice can be very different because somehow it's not always equal, right? Because sometimes the people that are even looking at your charts uh, are your competition. So um, do, you, do you all have a perspective on that? Because it is different. Somebody once told me that, you know, the daggers that are thrown at you in academic medicine are based on power. The daggers that are thrown at you in private practice are based on blocking somebody's financial stream. So if you could maybe, Kevin, do you want to just give us a perspective? And again, please feel free to be general about this because this can be very personal. So, you know, from, from my, what, what I have encountered in the private world is that there's really kind of two um, peer review processes. There's a formal one that can be, you know, somebody in an office or looking at charts that happen to come on their way, um, uh, it, you know, or it can be, um, you know, a committee of people that, have charged in rate by some, um, are, those charts are reviewed because of some outcome or some, you know, blood loss or, or return to the OR, that kind of thing. And that, that formal process is not, to me, that really just make, keeps the, the people that are making, you know, consistent mistakes that are way outside the standard of care. It keeps them from, from staying in the hospital. It's a way of identifying those, but for the rest of us in the 95%, that process doesn't really, at least for me, hasn't meant much. And doesn't importantly doesn't inform what I think is the real peer review process, which is sort of your reputation and, and the way that other people talk about you in these 
you know, in the, in when they're at their kid's soccer game and that, you know, and that kind of thing. And, or when they're talking about it, you know, when they're talking in the, in the lounge. And so that, that second one is really, I think it's two things. You can't, you can't get away from it. You have to, you have to be a part of it. You have to manage that. Um, uh, uh, but, but it can make or break you that, that really is, is a, a difficult thing. And if you're in the wrong, uh, yeah, I could go, I could go on for, <laughs> for hours with, with my thoughts about this, but if you're in the wrong culture and those people are not motivated to, to help you out either just by love of surgery or by financial incentive, um, it's, it's hard to make that, it's hard to make a practice work. Kerry, one, one minute on this. Yes. Um, you know, I would say, I think, um, actually, you know, uh, it is hard if it is sort of focused on single, uh, competitors. I think that actually, um, whenever you, uh, diversify it, even though we're, uh, an employed closed system, the, uh, peer review has gone to, um, include all the ho all the doctors that work at the hospital. So that has opened up to surgeons that have been in the community that work at all the hospitals in the city. And um, then it sort of leads back to kind of what Kevin was saying. Um, you know, everyone talks about you all the time in all different kind of venues. And, um, you know, if you're gonna be the person that does the majority within the city, um, your volume is so high that if you're, if you can't, you know, if, if you're going to have an unreasonable amount of complications or just something that's way off, there's just no way you're going to be able to um, hide from that. Thank you so, 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 so much. And just for the group, I mean, Sharona brought up, brought up a really good point, which is that sometimes, you know, you're doing a portal vein resection on a Whipple and it's been reviewed by a trauma surgeon or by a general surgeon that doesn't understand, you know, what this is about. Neumann, last thoughts before we move on to our cases. I think, I guess, I wasn't prepared for, I think someone mentioned, I guess the word is clueless, how peer review is to some of the stuff. You do, and I think it's just taking a step back. What I've had to, my very first time I got called on, you got very defensive, you know, very antagonistic. Well, this is things. So just taking a step back and realizing that 99% of the people, one, have no idea what we're doing and the complexity of it and what it entails for it. And what I've found is usually just kind of stepping back, telling them that this is the literature, this is the standard of care that we're doing, that this is, you know, this is how I train. We did this in fellowship. This is how I do things. Oh, you're not a vascular surgeon. Yes, I know how to do a portal vein resection. I do these parts of the things for it too. So I think once you take a step back and explain yourself, it, I haven't found it, but you know, just not real, realizing that when you get these letters and have to talk to the peer review committees, it's not a, you're a bad surgeon. It's just the system has no idea and maybe didn't, ex they want to do these cases, but they don't realize the other aspect that comes with these complex cases are the complex complications, unfortunately. Right, no, thank you very, very, very much. And I think from my perspective, two frustrations peer review wise, one, having somebody that has no idea what you're doing review a case. And second is having competition review your case at a very different level than they would their own. But anyway, let's move on. Thank you very much to our three panelists. We're now gonna go on to our next three panelists, Dr. Shirali Patel uh, at Ascension in uh, Maryland, Dr. Mark Mesler at Christ in Chicago, and Travis Van Meter, who's a colleague of mine here in uh, Dallas. And what I'm gonna do is share my screen and we're gonna talk about a metastatic rectal cancer case. Uh, Dr. Hogopian and Dr. Galanopoulos, please, please feel free to jump in with questions and generate chat, please. So uh, let me move on and Margie, please keep me on time at about 20 minutes, please, and send me a notification. So this is a 55 year old marathon runner who presented with hematochesia and underwent a colonoscopy that showed a nearly obstructing mass at six centimeters from the anal verge. The biopsy was adenocarcinoma, uh, RAS wild type and MSI stable. Uh, the MRI of the pelvis showed a T3C N1, colorect uh, the circumferential mesorectum was free CT and PET showed lesions in the liver and the pelvic lesion uh, lit up. This is our liver EOVIST MRI, and I'll try to slow this down so that you have a chance to take a look at this. So there's a lesion posterior right liver. There's a large lesion here, another lesion here, and then a lesion in segment three. Again, just to scroll through, so each of you has a 
good understanding of this case. And again, just some quick shots here of the actual lesions. And so at presentation, he's metastatic, liver only, nothing anywhere else, mesorectum is not threatened. So Dr. Mesler, how would you approach this case? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Thanks so much. Happy to be part of this panel. So, you know, I think the first thing I would say is you said, I think that he was nearly obstructing us clinically. The question is that primary tumor. Is it how symptomatic is nearly obstructing? Is it just He's being on really a really not symptomatic. Scope, scope could go through. So gotcha. um, at, at this point, a little anemic, but not symptomatic. Okay. So that, for me, that is a big uh, change of the pathway from, the, from up front. With that burden of disease in the liver, I definitely would start with some systemic chemotherapy first. Clearly in the stage four disease, uh, I would want to give some systemic therapy because he's presenting with this synchronous, you know, rectal cancer. Just to assess the biology of disease, see how they respond, especially not needing to do anything for the rectal tumor right away because like you said, clinically he's not obstructed. Okay, great. So, uh, so uh, we started out with chemotherapy and uh, this is, uh, he got four cycles of chemo with Folfox and the oncologist that saw him chose Vectabix as the biologic. And, you know, I just wanted just a minute to talk about chemotherapy here. This case is a little bit um, complex because certainly the lesions are quite bulky, but time of chemotherapy, and in my mind, you know, I just wanted to talk about the benefits of downsizing the tumor, conversion to resectability, study tumor biology, treat, treat microscopic disease. Our oncologists like to have in vivo testing, obviously. The downsides is that, you know, you cause liver toxicity, unable to give you some of your best agents and CT sensitivity decreases. I do want to shout out to Shirali Patel, who actually published on this, the, uh, the, uh, the use of EOVIST MRI in these patients, I think is really, really helpful. Post-op chemotherapy, again, lack of imageable disease, unable to study tumor biology, but less issue because you've done your liver resection already. And just briefly to go through the uh, EORT 4983 study, which was uh, uh, which looked at a perioperative chemotherapy uh, from the Nordlinger group, and they looked at progression-free survival and death. And really, what we saw over here was an improvement in progression-free survival. Uh, and in all resected patients, there was an improvement in uh, progression-free survival. But uh, I think that. A couple of things were important to me. One was that very few of these patients progressed on chemotherapy. And uh, so we can trust chemo. Um, and uh, the other thing was that there was a slightly higher risk of uh, complications post chemotherapy. So I just wanted to uh, finish with this last slide that shows that uh, in the overall five year data analysis, there was no difference in survival. So in our uh, group, we tend to use preoperative chemotherapy too, but you know, again, the data is not great on this. Sh Shirali, do you agree? Would you use uh, preoperative chemotherapy? Correct. I think in our group, also at our Cancer Institute, um, unless there was something else going on with the rectal portion for obstruction bleeding that needed some um, operative role for that, but with stage four cancer, our role here is to go with upfront uh, neoadjuvant preop chemotherapy. So just, just one quick thing is the nice thing about preoperative is also that your pathologic response does have some implication for, for your outcome. So that's nice. So this is what happened after four cycles of chemo. And Travis, um, we you know here would like to know if you, from an IR standpoint, can do anything to help us make this a safer surgery if we're thinking about a resection. So can you talk us through what our interventional radiologist is thinking at this point? So I think um, there'd be two main options, you know, trying to do a right hepatectomy safer, perhaps a, a portal vein embolization would help enlarge the future liver remnant uh, or you know, consideration for Y90 to the right liver uh, to, again, enlarge the left future liver remnant. So actually tell us about that, Travis, because a lot of people don't really think about Y90 as contra hypertrophy type of te techniques. How does that work for you and how do you dose that? Is there a difference in the way you dose this? Do you dose it as a radiation lobectomy or, or how do you do this? Yeah, it, it is a little bit higher dose when you're, when you're trying to 
you know, basically incinerate the entire right lobe causing hypertrophy of the left. It does take longer than portal vein embolization to see the hypertrophy. Um, but you know, you, you do have the, obviously the added benefit of actually trying to treat and shrink down the tumor in the right. Okay. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving. So he got two more cycles of fall Fox and, uh, his scan continued to improve beautifully. Actually, this gentleman was very chemo responsive. And what we have is this left liver lesion decreasing greatly in size. Uh, I just wanted to point out the EOVIST MRI over here with the uh, biliary excretion. So you get a free cholangiogram if you notice the bile duct with, with excretion in it. And then you've got this lesion that's straddling the uh, middle uh, or I guess the anterior right uh, hepatic vein. So uh, Mark, what do you think you would do at this point? I would call you, Rohan. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, looking at this, I, I think in this imaging, you did not do portal vein embolization. This is purely systemic chemotherapy. Correct. And the reason with that response. was access in that right portal vein, it was already very, very, very attenuated. I, you, you don't see it as well on these images, but the right portal vein was very, very attenuated by that large lesion. And the reason I ask is that it looks almost like the left lobe was hypertrophying with the chemotherapy as well. Correct. Um, so I think that that's encouraging. That spot on the left, sorry, I don't know if you guys can hear my two-year-old child screaming in the background. <laughs> so that lesion in the left is pretty small. That can be treated with a wedge. And then the question is, it's looking on this imaging is really, to me, that middle hepatic vein. Where is that involved? It seems the tumor seems to be straddling on both sides of it, which is a little bit worrisome. Well, I um, think really you've got you this that. sort of medial or sort of accessory medial vein over here. So I thought that we, not easily, but that this would be amenable to a right trisection, basically. Um, Shirali, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it seems resectable, but there's also a lesion you said in the left lobe there, um, right. right? That could be ablated if, you, um, if we're thinking of too much of the liver being compromised. Right. Um, but right. I think uh, we'd be able to resect that right side of that liver and with that left lobe lesion, um, an opportunity for it, a blade of therapy, if it's less than, we use microwave and we use angiodynamics. And I think if it's less than three centimeters would be amenable to have good margins around that to um, take care of that left lobe lesion. If we think we aren't compromising too much of the liver with taking out the right lobe. Sure. Sure. So shout out to Medtronic too, because good, good, good microwave technology with, with them also. So uh, we have some options over here. Travis, so, it, you know, you and I have done this sometimes where you've done a right PVE and then you've done an ablation at the same time. And uh, just, do you want to talk us through that? Uh, yeah, I mean, we will often uh, do that, not at the same setting, uh, but, uh, you know, in close succession, uh, the portal vein embo, you know, sometimes we use lapidol to highlight uh, the, uh, the, to identify the lesions for ablation, but uh, you know, we can all get it done with about a week time. Perfect, okay. So I, so, I mean, I'm uh, lucky. Yes. So Rohan, there's an interesting question in the chat um, from Dr. Ahmed. Um, it's asking what would be the panelists opinion if this were a anal squamous cancer with a large solitary met to the right liver. I'd ask if anybody's seen that. That's um, an interesting yeah. position. Typically treated, you know, squamous cancers, yeah. typically treated with chemo radiation. Right. So, um, so anyone, Mark or Shirali, have you seen that circumstance? I yeah, I haven't ex seen that personally myself with anus squamous cell that's met to the liver. Obviously, it's all treated with um, like radiation and um, chemotherapy. Um, so, chemotherapy. So I actually have a, I have a couple of patients that I've seen and, and, and if they've got a good disease-free interval, we'll usually start out with chemotherapy for squame. And then if this is the only thing, then we could do that. Let me just also, one other question for you, Travis, um, you know, when you've got a, uh, when you're doing neoadjuvant Y90, what do you do chemotherapy wise? I know that initially we used to hold chemo for quite a while, but we're quite aggressive with chemo these days, correct? Yeah, I mean, unless they're uh, on Avastin, you know, we really kind of just treat through it. So Avastin's really the only thing that we would hold in this situation. 
Well, in the interest of time, I want to keep going. So we did a right trisection, left ablation. He had an extensive, wonderful response to chemotherapy. Close margin, but did great. Um, he continued um, with, uh, with his chemotherapy, um, actually struggled a little bit. And I was worried that this was portal hypertensive related from the extensive liver resection and maybe some uh, chemo related liver injury. Bone marrow was normal, spleen size was normal through all of this, and his scans did great. So we started in 2017, and we're now at, at about 20, uh, t end of 2018. So what would people do at the primary? So Mark, this is a rectal cancer. What do you do now? It's still in sight. Yeah, you know, I think if you've got the benefit of time and seeing how well he did with chemotherapy and a large resection ablation, he's still doing well. I would consider being aggressive and going after the primary tumor. Now, I, I guess the question is whether or not you'd want to give him radiation, because you said it was, I think, a T2N1 lesion initially. It was actually T3N1, but mesorectum is not threatened. So this is sort of, again, a little odd yeah. because I, I, I do rectal work myself. So what, what do we do, right, in the metastatic circumstances? Shirali, in your mind, as you're thinking about radiation for rectal cancer, what do you think the main aim of that is? Yeah, it's, it's to get a good plane in the mesorectal area and downsize that tumor. Um, but if you feel like the tumor was downsized well with the chemotherapy and you thought the mesorectal plane was good, I mean, our institution, I think we'd provide radiation still to that site. Um, yeah, it's, it's, what really about controversial. I... it's really controversial to do a radiation sparing regimen, but just to talk about the options, we've got continue chemotherapy, five a few plus radiation stand, of course, right, six weeks, or five by five, like the Dutch trial, and then operate the next week. And just to kind of talk to you about what this would look like, six weeks, rectal surgery, and then adjuvant chemo. But, you know, you're waiting so long to get chemotherapy in your regular patients. So we talk about this or we talk about flipping it and doing chemo first and then the, the, uh, the sur sur surgery. And I want to just give a shout out to Alessandra Ficero, who's one of my uh, colleagues here in town, because I, uh, I, um, I uh, borrowed a slide. So Matham, you're right. I would consider a total neoadjuvant approach in this patient. So the memorial uh, protocol is Fall Fox times six with Bev for the last until the last two cycles. If they respond, go straight to surgery. If not, they get um, uh, chemo radiotherapy. And the idea here is just look at this data. The the four year local recurrence, which is really the key issue with radiation, was zero percent in these patients. So you know we I think we use radiation for local recurrence issues, but one could say that their systemic manifestation trumps everything else. So I just wanted to point out the uh, prospect trial that is ongoing right now. And uh, actually it's closed, but the, the data is still accruing. And what this is, is randomized one-to-one -one with fall fox. And if your response to fall fox times six was greater than 20%, you go to TME. If you do not respond, then you fall into the chemo radiation arm and then TME. So I'm a huge fan of avoiding uh, chemothera uh, radiation therapy in, this, in these patients. And this is what a scan looked like with pelvic MR. So again, the mesorectal plane is well preserved in this patient. I, I can get that with a TME beautifully. And he's only got this extent of tumor over here. All of the nodes were also within the mesorectal plane. So just to, just to move forward, you know, the questions are, does he need radiation resection or definitive therapy? And I wanted to bring up rectal cancer for HPV surgeons, because I think it's important that we understand this disease. So he uh, went on and had a, diverting, a robotic low anterior with diverting loop ileostomy. And this was his pathology, a YPT2N1 R0. So any uh, discussion or any thoughts or anything in the chat, Ellen, uh, that you would... Uh, want to bring up? I, I think the, the five by five regimen was brought up by Mathan, and I agree with you, Mathan. I think that's a really good way to look at this too, is five by five. The truth is, since we're in private practice, I do want to tell you that a lot of the radiation oncologists get paid by the dose, and they don't like to do the five by five. They want to do six weeks. So that is a challenge in the, in the real world. So let me just move on really quickly, and we'll finish up with this case. He's doing great, 18 months post-resection. And then we have this. 
Um, so this is his ablation site. And there's an area that actually doesn't show up well, but there's an area of enhancement. So this we think is a recurrence at the ablation site. Dr. Patel, what would you do in this uh, case? Um, one, I mean, reassessing that area, I guess one option would be, could you further ablate that area depending on that that liver remnant since you've already did a right triseg, which I didn't know if it was a right triseg versus a right liver since the middle it's hepatic vein right was fine. It's yeah. really just the right hepatectomy. Okay. It's like, I felt like it was just a right hepatectomy. Yeah. Um, so that area, one can be reassessed at, with an further ablation um, with the further margin um, around that area with a wider area of ablative site. Um, I think he already went through the chemotherapy because one, is it something where, is that tumor biology a little bit different from anything else? I don't know if you need a biopsy of that. It's gonna be hard in that area to get it with that ablative site, um, but could further systemic chemotherapy it be a, um, an option for the patient as well as further ablating that site? I Travis, think it's also kind of close. You could you wedge that out too in that area. Right. Travis, what do you think uh, IR wise? I mean, I, I think uh, I'm trying to remember which portion of that is actually the tumor, which is ablation. So, I mean, yeah. I think I think it is ablatable again if that's a consideration. I mean, obviously wedge is a is okay. a strong consideration. Mom? Can I ask where is the recurrence, please? Can you yeah, it's it out and how large is it? Actually, in this area. Mm -hmm. in the superior aspect. And it's and and it's what, maybe a centimeter or two? Correct, correct. Yeah, Mark? Yeah, you know, I think that it's, I agree with Charlie, it's pretty superficial. It would be pretty amenable to a white resection as long as that remaining liver function hasn't been tubered out from the chemotherapy. So I really want to assess the hepatic function prior to doing a white resection, but it's a little bit, you know, lucky that it's on the surface. You have that part of the previous ablation that you can identify uh, as you know, help you get a margin on a wedge. So I actually, uh, I actually took him to the OR. We did get a PET for systemic disease, as mentioned by Zubir, and resected this. It was a close margin. It was a lot harder than I thought, actually, because this left liver remnant was huge, and this was way deep underneath. Um, and then the question was, because my margin was close, would we do anything further? I just want to finish up with this case because we need to move on. And this is what happened to him actually about a year and a half after this, he developed another lesion in the chordate that caused biliary obstruction. We stented this and started him back on chemo and he's responded beautifully. And right now he's actually, I can't even find the lesion, but I believe that this is too close to his left portal vein and left hepatic duct to do anything further. I thought about IRE in this case, uh, since it would be around the duck, but I personally don't have a lot of experience. Does anyone, Mark, Shirali, anyone in the panelists have any uh, thought? No, I say I don't have any experience with IRE at all, um, but I probably leave it alone. He did well, responded to chemo and follow that lesion maybe over time. Um, yep, yep. And it. the other thought was a HAI in him now. So he's actually being evaluated by Nancy Kemeny. So in, in, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop over here and let's move to our next set of panelists. Christos, over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to introduce uh, Dr. Ross, I think, is here, uh, Dr. Ali and um, Dr. Osman. Uh, so um, if Margie can bring up the, the slides for me, or who has those? Unfortunately, I'm not the head of IT for my practice. Uh, so this is a case, um, it is an acute pancreatitis, but the evolution of it into some really chronic complications um, I thought would be good to talk about. But I think really important is what happened during this case in the world, and that was the pandemic. And so it really started changing how we actually had to deal with this patient. So go ahead to the next slide, please. And so here's a kid, he's 35, works as a mechanic, um, uh, lives in Reno, Nevada. Uh, you know, we, we uh, were doing well prior to COVID, you know, unemployment rate was great. And he decided to have a little binge time, got a pretty significant alcohol uh, uh, pancreatitis, um, scans showed no gallstones. 
But you can see the numbers, uh, lipase three greater than 3,000, his glucose was up, white count was 20.9, AST was elevated, ALT was elevated, his bilirubin was 4.5, MRCP was negative for any stones or common uh, obstructions or, or dilation. BU and creatinine were up. Um, and as many of us know that the first person called is actually general surgery, not the people who actually deal with pancreatitis on a regular basis or, or necrotic pancreatitis. So if you can run the scan real quick, this is his initial admission scan. So you can see there's you know pretty good inflammation, but it's it's what's what's interesting is that it's not horrendous. But look at his numbers, you know something's happening with him. Um, so let's start. Uh, if you go to the next slide, real quick. And so here's some questions. First impressions, Dr. Ross, looking at the scan and then looking at his numbers. Well, I would. Uh, I'm I'm not. It's it's still in the beginning. I would just sit tight. I would. Uh, um, see how we, just clinical, clinically he does with support, and um, and just watch him. Not do too much, nothing aggressive. Just let it uh, let it be. Right, right, Dr. Ali. Uh, same thing. Just kind of watch him for right now, and then um, yeah. you know, cases like this. As soon as we get called, I just take them onto my service, just so people don't start doing things to these people for it. Right. So you find that they're very. At first, I thought I was going to piss people off, but it's very much, oh, yeah, that's great. You're going to handle this. Great. Just take care of it. Right. So going back and speaking with the general surgeon who was called after I had been called, and you'll see when I was called, uh, I, I actually, they, they told me, she told me that she was actually filling out the grants and criteria. Does anybody use any type of severity index in pancreatitis, or is that pretty much out the window and you go by, you know, patchy scores or anything? Just say, he's pretty sick. Get him on your service. Take care of him. Dr. Osman? Yeah, so uh, that's really assessing severity is, is, is an important thing because it truly, it uh, kind of guide you where do you locate this patient. Do you put them in the intensive care unit? Is this patient is going to go to the floor? Is this patient going to go to an intermediate care? Uh, you can use whatever you're comfortable with. I would say that I don't see a lot of people use uh, Ransom criteria anymore. I like to use uh, uh, C-reactive protein and, and, and uh, calcitonin and kind of to kind of help me uh, determine if the patient is at risk for developing necrosis or infecting necrosis. Yeah, yeah, that was the point I was making in general surgery that obviously they don't deal, they see this more often than we do, but they are, you know, we're talking about back when I was training at Cook County Hospital with Ransom's criteria, so back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, who do you want on your team, Ali, Dr. Ali? So you, uh, you said you take them in your service, but obviously, you know, you're gonna need some help along the way here. Yeah. I mean, in terms of like the, the scoring thing, we, we use BICEP here and it's taken about, it's still in the evolution of a like an eight month process of starting from the ER. If it's a BICEP less than two, it can get to medicine, but anything greater than three or up, surgery gets consulted automatically. And then I've kind of hammered into everyone just consult surgery. So it's us leading it usually is HPB. Then if IR is needed for core pack or, you know, if we need a drain in then that to them, and I don't consult GI or anyone till I'm ready for an endoscopic approach for anything. Um, for it too. So it's mostly just myself, um, and my team and interventional radiology, um, kind of when we need them. Okay. And then yeah, Rock, ICU, ICU care. Yeah. Rock, do, you, uh, do you get the general surgeon call calling you or do you get the call up front for these types of cases? For pancreatitis, so I'm at Advanel Health Tampa, and we a tertiary hospital. So all pancreas and liver comes to us. All esophageal cancers and complex operations come to us. And so even though we have acute care, uh, they will immediately consult us for all the pancreatitics. And we like that because we have then control. The hardest thing to educate people not to do is to do more for pancreatitis. You just need to do supportive therapy until we absolutely need to do something, which is usually then endoscopically ther type of therapy rather than surgical. Dr. Osman, how about if it was gallstone pancreatitis or some other origin of pancreatitis, would you, would you approach it differently or would you still do the same thing? Watchful waiting, needs to get in the ICU and it sounds like he's heading that way. Um, you know, the, the, the treatment of the pancreatitis portion itself is the same with, con with conservative management. The, the question that if you have gallstone pancreatitis, you want to make sure that you don't have uh, uh, cold 
that Kuyoko touches and cholangitis because that will require intervention to address that. Although with goldstone pancreatitis, it's usually a patchy stone that causes the pancreatitis. And even if you see an elevated bilirubin on presentation, the majority of the time that bilirubin will drop the following day. But if there's a concern for uh, cholangitis or cholangitis or cholangitis, that will need to be addressed. Uh, cholestatitis, for the most part, can be addressed with antibiotic. Really, you need a cholestatitis acute. For cholestatitis or cholangitis, you'll need an ERCT. Hyper uh, uh, trigonosinia, you can manage that with medication as well. But the point is that for the pancreatitis portion itself, it's still conservative management. You don't need intervention for the pancreatitis portion early on. I agree with Dr. Law. Great. Thanks. Next slide, please. So four days later or five days later, he's intubated. Uh, he's on dialysis. Uh, kidney fails. Uh, white counts 24. Nine, but LFT start to correct except for his bilirubin and calcium 8.4. Uh, so at this time, general surgery placed a hemodialysis catheter and he's on the critical care team of the medicine side. Can you play the video again? This is his subsequent scan six days later. Okay, next slide. Thank you. All right, Dr. Ross, second impressions. Now that you see that scan and now that he's, he's gotten worse. Well, he has gotten worse, but uh, it doesn't make him where he needs to be surgical in any way. So I would continue with supportive therapy um, and uh, do everything possible. Like he, he's, he's been intubated. Um, and we'll just watch him very closely. I wouldn't do anything surgical. You've answered all four questions, all with one answer. Dr. Ali, same thing? Yeah, same thing. I wouldn't change anything. I think I think he doesn't have a core pack. I think it's just an NG tube. So that'd be about the only thing for it. Right, um, or like a nasal jejunal tube uh, for feeding, but that wouldn't do anything. Um, maybe get an all shine. I mean, his biliary has been dilated here for this is how many days now? This is six days, seven days, you said? Yeah, he's six days post. It went up from four, I think, 4.5 to 7.7. .7. Yeah, and ultrasound to see if his, maybe his biliary ductal dilatation to see if he needs decompression of his biliary tree. That'd be the only thing I would do to check that. Dr. Rossman? No, I agree with Noman and Dr. Ross. Same thing. I mean, his uh, rising the I think it's related to his alcohol, but I agree that I would get an uh, MRI or MRCP to rule out biliary dilation, which I don't see on CT scan. Uh, regarding the nutrition, I'm a little bit hesitant about starting them on uh, a Q feed, uh, especially in the early acute phase if they are requiring high uh, amount of pressors, just because the risk of uh, intestinal ischemia will increase uh, the blood demand to the intestine. But okay. they, will need some, they, will, they will need nutrition support. But usually I go TPN if they are on a high amount of pressor early on, although uh, intro feeding is usually superior to uh, parental nutrition. Yeah, he was initially, he was essentially started on TPN and then switched over as time went on. Next slide. So on uh, the 5th of March, he actually got discharged home on hemodialysis. So he continued with renal failure, got a, 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 a cath put in, uh, tolerating a general diet, uh, pain well managed. He's still on chronic pain meds, but he's doing well. CT scan planned for the end of March to assess the pancreas. LFT is normalized except for the AST. Blood sugars were elevated, white count normalized. And as many of these tough people in Reno, he showed up back to work uh, a week after that <laughs> and started as a mechanic. Uh, uh, but he's starting to develop the exocrine and endocrine dysfunction. The right column there is what I think is interesting about this case. So first case of COVID was actually diagnosed on that day when he went home. Uh, sooner after that, within the month, unemployment went from 3.2 to 20.8. PPEs were restricted in Reno. Obviously, that happened across the country. Uh, that limited OR procedures. He, we only we went to doing just ACS tier threes were allowed and emergency surgeries. And pretty much the other three hospital uh, ORs were in lockdown. So next slide. So he feels better now we're in May, right? So May, he's off dialysis, labs normalized, he's working, but after work, he comes home because of the COVID. Uh, main complaints, abdominal distension, little weight loss, uh, his appetite wasn't 100% and fatigue. Again, uh, every elective and uh, only emergency cases are allowed. PPE is still hard to come by. 
so here's a scan. And I know we've all seen that before. So uh, he's doing good, but he's got this huge pseudocyst. Looks pretty liquefied, a little heterogeneous at certain points. But Dr. Ross, anything you do at this point? He's clinically he's doing well. I will just watch him do nothing, absolutely nothing, and won't let GI, if they're following, to do anything. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ali, you're, you're smiling. Yeah. Same thing. I mean, I had the exact same case, except my patient had COVID uh, for it. And we just wrote it out, just told him he's, if he's working, he's eating, um, his labs are normally he's off dialysis. I said, just watch it. There's no indication to do anything. And I agree with Dr. Ross, just keeping GI away because they'll put a stent on this before you know it. Dr. Osman? Agree, treat the patient at the CT. Yeah. Go to the next slide, please. So we talked about what to do now. Watchful waiting, sounds like we all agree. Uh, on the outpatient team, we obviously got rid of GI uh, and we're just keeping him in our clinic and hiding him. Uh, good news is there's a pandemic, so he doesn't go anywhere. Uh, and uh, the question, my real quick, how did the pandemic impact your practice um, dealing with these complex cases and some of these pancreatitis? Obviously, Dr. Early, you mentioned he actually had COVID, but did you make adjustments outside uh, due to the OR lockdowns and things, or, or did it change anything for you? Um, it didn't. I mean, a couple of them, um, we, like the patient I had, he had COVID, he had transferred because he had COVID and had a pretty large pseudocyst, like a 10 centimeter pseudocyst. And GI said, you know, we're not doing anything for this. He has COVID for a tube. The guy was symptomatic. So we did a laparoscopic transgastric cyst gastrostomy on it. And the guy went home in two days um, for it. So We've been, thankfully, we haven't had a shutdown shutdown for it too. And we've been kind of for cases like this, if we had to, the hospital has been okay with us doing it, but it's been very selective yeah. sort of things. Dr. Ross? Um, my practice has changed to mainly cancer operations. So all HPV right. uh, cancers and four got no problem with opening the ORs for those. Uh, all electives were not allowed, but for this kind of, pa of patients, uh, if we send them to endoscopy, endoscopy suite was open for those specifically, but they won't do like EGD Bravo, but right, there right. were procedures like this. Yes. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. So this is September now. So we went from May to September. So another, you know, three, four months, fevers at home, pulse pumping up, blood pressure stable, but white count goes up, platelet counts showing a reaction. Glucose up, creatinine is normalized, LFTs are normal, fit for alpha. Got admitted and scanned. Uh, if you could run the video uh, again, now ORs are fully functional. All ORs are open. We got enough PPE. Um, he's developing SIRS. Uh, COVID numbers are increasing, though. So the admits to the hospital and bed availability is somewhat restricted, along with ICU beds. Dr. Uh, Osman, you see the scan. Yes, at this point, with his clinical presentation, the CT finding, he has inf infected uh, world of pancreatic necrosis. So I would admit this patient to the hospital, IV antibiotics, and in this case, I would treat him with uh, uh, an IR percutaneous drain going through the left uh, uh, retroperitoneal area. Dr. Ross? Uh, I would uh, send it, do the same thing, except I would not send him to IR. I will... Uh, um, I, the, the truth is, I, I agree with him here. I, it's it's still not abutting the the stomach. Do you have any coronals in those in those? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't upload those just from the. Were there any abutment to the stomach? Yeah, because there is. Up, uh, up there, there is some abutment with uh, the posterior, the dorsal aspect of the stomach. Uh, my preference will always be endoscopically. We have great endoscopists, and they can do all the necrosectomies, and 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 we've done them, and they'll do multiple if necessary if there's a connection to the pancreatic duct. So that will be my preference. I don't like when I leave them with controlled fistula to the outside world. Okay, great. For time's sake, let's go to the next slide. Christos, can I just ask the group, are we, are we all comfortable doing some sort of internal drainage in the face of air, Naaman? Yeah, I mean, I, if there's something like this, if it's able to, I would do a, a lap transgastric um, 
drainage is kind of what we've moved to doing there, even kind of moving away sometimes from the the percutaneous drains. And in, in the setting of COVID too, just single stage, debride it, done with it. Um, and you don't have these patients with these chronic drains that are sticking out for weeks and weeks and coming, you know, with COVID coming back and forth in the hospital for drain upsides and everything like that for it too. So we moved to just doing a laparoscopic transgastric debridement for them. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, for time's sake, we have five minutes. Um, so infected pseudocyst, I was finally consulted on the 9 6 17, 2020 General surgery has been doing this uh, without a uh, thing. And antibiotics, not septic, feels bad. Offered surgery, kind of what you mentioned that early, um, with a necrosectomy, retroperitoneal drainage, transfer, either a robotic or open. He didn't want it. He, did, he was worried about losing his job, not getting back to work. He's lo losing his house due to the COVID, uh, unemployment's through the roof. So we offered IR drains. Go to the next slide. So go ahead and run that. Thank you. So we had two drains placed, uh, but noted new ascites. And what's interesting uh, on the previous film that his portal vein is out from the pancreatitis. So they placed the two drains um, and he started doing better. And you can see where they are. There's one retroperitoneal on the left and then one uh, towards the tail. Um, next slide. So are we happy now? We got drains in, he's feeling better. Anything about the portal vein? Would, or, and would you recommend anticoagulation? Dr. Osman? I will not unless he has a uh, symptom of uh, uh, venous congestion, which is very, very unusual in these circumstances. So, but no, I will not recommend anticoagulation. Dr. Ali? Yeah, same thing. If he's occluded just from the the external compression of everything too, I would not just for the risk of it turning into a hemorrhagic pancreatitis. All right, Dr. Ross, I see you nodding, you agree. Okay. Absolutely. Next slide. Go ahead and run the video while I talk. Uh, he go, so he goes back to work now with two drains. Uh, again, he's a tank. Uh, several upsizes, luckily we were able to do that. Like I said, we were wide open. Ascites a little worse. Uh, he had a couple clogged drains, obviously, in the ER, worried about COVID, improving pain, um, stays off dialysis, which is great, uh, but his, you know, exocrine answer gets worse as uh, findings. Next slide, please. And Chris, uh, we, we yeah. just have about two minutes. I yeah. want to make sure that we get to the key points. Yeah, so uh, so drains work, collections are resolving, pain well managed, everything gets better. Uh, you know, we're still dealing with COVID. Here's some pictures. You can see the two drains have upsized, changed a little bit, but essentially those collections are almost gone. Ascites still there. Next slide. Anything to change, Dr. Rost? I think it looks pretty good. It's actually great results. We've had situations like this where it didn't, didn't happen that well. And we had to do some debridement uh, and tracing the drain up and do a nice debridement and, and a lot of irrigation and that healed from the inside out. But this, you have great results there. Yeah. Uh, next slide. One more, go ahead. No output on the drains. Christoph, Again, while this is going, did you have any thoughts regarding the ascites? This is well, that's one of my questions. Does anybody want to treat the ascites? Has it been tapped? Have we checked, like tapped and checked it for an oh, ambulance? Cultures are negative, strange enough. It's always on that right side. How is isolated. the patient doing? I'm sorry? How is the patient doing? I wouldn't do anything to the ascites unless he's not doing well. Uh, he, he complains of distension a little bit, but that's about it. Next slide. So once these uh, grains, we did a gram stain, good, uh, a gram of the drain, and you can see that it just, that was it, only left. All the drains came out. He did great. I can tell you that we actually did a paracentesis on him for comfort. Um, he did uh, have trouble a little at work because he's bending over, picking up heavy things, and it bothered him. So we did that. Cultures were negative, and he's disease, or, you know, he's doing well now. Except he, And he's got a you know, continuous glucose monitor. He's on pancreatic enzymes for his lifeline. So... So just a couple of additional questions for the audience uh, or for the panelists. Hussam, would you consider studying this guy thinking that he may have a disconnected duct or do you not really care at this point? Uh, I, would, 
I think I would have likely diagnosed that early on. I would have gotten an MRI at some point, especially when he came in uh, with that uh, collection, the symptomatic collection the second time around. Uh, the MRI, uh, my uh, aim and gain from the, from the MRI be two things. One, to look at the composition of the, uh, his world of pancreatic roses the uh, 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 ratio between solid and, and, and liquid component to guide my management. And the second will look at the pancreatic duct. Is if, he has a dis if he has a disconnected duct, then the likelihood that he is getting some intervention at some point, but I don't think I would intervene unless he's symptomatic from that disconnected duct and it seems like he's not symptomatic at this point. Okay, and uh, Dr. Ali, um, any concerns about pancreatic ascites in this case? I mean, with the persistent uh, ascites there and concern for a possible duct, because you see that whole like distal tail is basically gone for it too. So I guess, I mean, I would tap it. If it showed amylase positive, I would send him for an ERCP and a stent um, to see to help with the ascites if it's really that bad. And then you can study the duct to see for it and then just give it time. Hopefully it heals. Sure, sure, Rona, you're nodding your head. Yeah, I agree. You have to divert that, uh, that uh, leak to uh, through an ERCP, so I agree. Whatever we can do to divert that leak, yeah. if, if it's there. And, 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 and I think Dr. Osmond and I had a patient where they placed the drain through the left chest, so we had a beautiful pancreaticopleural fistula, which is just and, delightful. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> uh, Ellen, any, any other thoughts with this? We have just a minute or two before moving to your case. Just um, follow up, uh, Christos. Um, portal vein still out, you know, um, anticipating, how would you follow this pa patient, anticipating further complications with him? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, uh, he's a lucky guy. Um, the, probably the, he'll need an MRCP uh, eventually. Um, uh, his ascites is resolved, you know, he's connected with endocrine uh, to manage his glucose uh, and his uh, exocrine part. I kind of manage the exocrine part. But he's doing well, and I think the what Dr. Ross said early on is do little. You know, one of my mentors when I was training said, "A good surgeon knows what to do, and a great surgeon knows what not to do." And so, you can quote me like that, Christos. Yeah, but I love that. <laughs> well, I think Chris is the patients, so. right? So anyway, yeah. So you know, it's easily you can easily get in trouble with this. So I think we're just going to go slowly and see how he does. We need to make sure he never drinks alcohol again. Yeah, and he hasn't, thankfully. Yeah, he really learned a lesson. So. And and just to just to finish that thought, Naaman, if they if he shows up and he's got blood in his drain, I would send him for a CTA just to check CT uh, arterial and venous phase to make sure it's not a pseudo aneurysm or something we can embolize. Because I was just waiting for that next uh, next yeah. <laughs> drop in this because it's you know you saw the splenic artery bathed with 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 junk so. All yeah. right, let me just make sure, Ellen, anything else in the chat? Uh, scoping him to check for gastric varices was brought up by one of our uh, a group. Uh, Dr. Osman, would you, would you empirically scope him or just if you had bleed? Only if I had bleed. Okay, yeah. and again, quite a bit of concern about uh, doing any sort of anticoagulation in this patient because of the risk of a pseudoaneurysm, is that correct? That and I is think correct. The data is not that good, right, Ellen, on anticoagulation in these cases? Yeah, yeah, I would most certainly stay away from anticoagulation. <laughs> Again, it's it's trying to keep the keep the uh, the patient away from you know others, <laughs> quite frankly. So yeah, less is more with this patient. Great case. Yeah, let's let's move on to your case, Dr. Hagopian. So we'll have yeah. our next set of panelists. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali, Dr. Uh, Osman, and Sharona Ross. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. You're a rock star and a fashion icon. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks, so, Brian. and thank you, Christos. Um, great. Well, I just want to welcome back to our panel, um, Carrie Simo, and also introduce uh, Dr. Randy Zuckerman, um, and also Jen Pasco, um, who are going to um, help me through this uh, this biliary case. So, 
Um, we have a 69 year old woman who initially presented in July of 2017 with some upper abdominal pain and nausea. Um, really sounded like symptomatic cholelithiasis, but for sure she had a laparoscopic cholecystectomy done um, previously. And she noted that the pain that she had was very similar to her pre-cholecystectomy pain. Um, so you see that, see her labs, they're pretty straightforward, normal. And the ultrasound, the transdominal ultrasound um, showed absence of the gallbladder. And that's really all the report that we got. So she's got, um, she's actually pretty healthy for, um, for a, a 69 year old. She does have a history of diabetes that's well controlled. She had her cholecystectomy done four years prior. And her physical exam is really very um, non-revealing and no jaundice on, on the exam. So she un had undergone an upper endoscopy, which essentially um, showed no pathology, um, but the uh, endoscopist also pulled out his endoscopic ultrasound and said that she had a dilated duct. So wondering what your thoughts are, Dr. Zuckerman, about this case. What was oh. the next step? So, you know, we, we need some reasonable imaging to see what her bile duct looks like. Um, you know, is this just post-cholecystectomy, biliary dilatation? Does she have sphincter of OD dysfunction? Um, what sort of imaging did she have four years prior when her gallbladder came out? So I'm in the need more information stage of this game. Yeah, great. So, so, so tell me, Dr. Simo, what would be your, your choice of um, your next step? Um, Dr. Zuckerman talked about, could this be sphincter of OD dysfunction? Like what would be your next step? My next step would be to get an MRI, MRCP, to mm -hmm. actually be able to visualize the duct. Yeah, yeah. So we're surgeons. We want imaging. We want to see it, right? Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Dr. Pasco, um, any thoughts about um, the potential for sphincter vodi dysfunction in this patient? I think that from my standpoint, just I think probably when I think of things that are more common, I would say that it's probably post-cholecystectomy um, dilatation of uh, the bile duct would be my most common thing that I would think of. Um, but I agree, I think MRI, MRCP would be the next step for me. Yeah, great. And that's what we did, of course. So um, I have to say that I don't know that my pictures are gonna be as pretty as, uh, as uh, Christos's, but we're gonna do our best here. So, so this is her MRI. And if I can slow it down at some point, I will. Um, and you'll see that she's got, um, she's got some dilation. She's got mm, here, she's got something right there, right? So this is, this is a T2 weighted image. Um, I'm hoping that this is projecting well over Zoom for everybody. All right, and I'm just kind of, I'm still scrolling down and soon my video is gonna just show this going back up. Okay, this is now going back up. See pancreatic duct, there's a diet and there's the dilated duct. So thoughts about this, does anybody wanna take a look at something? Want me to reshow it, um, Doctor? Show the tip of the right and left, please. please. Yeah, great. Thank you, Doctor Pasco. Let me sh bring this back there and see how well I can slow this down. Get this over. And Not sure how well this is projecting, Dr. Pasco, but 
We can see that one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good, good, perfect. All right, great. Um, thought, other thoughts, Dr. Simo, Dr. Zuckerman, before I move on. Ellen, do you, do you have the MRCP images or the kernels? Yeah, thank you for asking. So here's our MRCP. I'm just gonna let that run through. You see your pancreatic duct there, and then we'll, yep. and this is coming back anteriorly again. All right, so just slow yeah. that down. All right. So thoughts about thoughts about this, uh, Dr. Zuckerman. Yeah. So this is interesting. Uh, you know. I'm trying to figure out where her cystic duct used to live. Um, so, and then I'm also wondering sort of what things look like four years ago, because this is not a new problem. Um, but she has biliary dilatation from sort of halfway up her common duct to her bifurcation. Um, and so the question is, is this a coledocal cyst or is this a problem secondary to her previous operation? Yeah, yeah, good thoughts. Dr. Simo. I'm trying to get to uh, where the cystic duct joins uh, the bile duct. And it also looks like there's a little more uh, intrahepatic ductal dilatation on that left side. Yeah, Dr. Pascal. Yeah, I concur. I think the left duct looks a little um, uh, like it may be involved, but I agree there's fusiform dilation of the main common duct, um, which is abnormal, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So thoughts about her management. She's got this, she's got abdominal pain. She's got this nausea that's postprandial. What, do you, what are your, your thoughts about what to do with this, this case? More work I guess, up. I was gonna say, so, I guess my thought, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say my thought would be to actually get an, uh, an ERCP um, so they could see if oh, there's pretty. actually even, you know, potentially some, uh, you know, look and see if there's some stones or any other, uh, you know, structure, anything else that's inside. They may potentially even, you know, if something looks abnormal, look with a spyglass or something mm -hmm. just to make sure it's all just uh, due to the cyst. And not something else, uh, you know, underlying either either stones or uh, or a potential underlying tumor. Okay, great, Dr. Pasco. Uh, any thoughts there? I actually think that's a really good idea. It also may give you. They may be able to comment on the left duct as well. I like the idea of spyglass as well. Um, but uh, I think that that would be my next step. I think it's important to understand if it's a type one or a type four or an injury. Um, yeah. So, so, Ellen, I just kind of want to ask a question, though, because don't you think that if this was a structural stone that we would have seen a stone on the MRCP? And if it was a stricture that there would be some outfoss elevation in this patient? And my second question is, uh, you know, are we not a little bit concerned about the potential for post-ERCP pancreatitis that may end up with a major issue in this patient that may delay everything? Because is it going to change anything here? Mm -hmm. Thoughts? So I, I guess I would say that, um, you know, unfortunately, I feel like I have seen not, you know, it's not frequent, but, you know, probably at least a couple times a year, I do see patients that have stones in the, you know, have stones in the duct or even, you know, a lot of sludge that you haven't necessarily seen by, uh, by their liver function test. And while the MRCP is good, it's not, you know, it's not perfect. But um, yeah, I mean, to your point, um, you know, obviously, yes, you do have to think about the uh, potential for posting your RCP pancreatitis. Randy, what are your thoughts? I, I mean, I, I fully appreciate what you're saying. I, I would likely 
uh, get an ERCP with Spyglass on this person. I, I don't know that it's going to change what I'm going to do, uh, but it'll make me feel better. And, and, yeah. and again, I just want to ask though, but on Spyglass, you're looking for tumor or you're biopsying and trying to see if it's a cholidogosis? Because some people think that the lining can be somewhat suggestive because for me i would take this patient straight to the operating room i just wanted to yeah no i think i think the final i think the final common pathway is somewhat clear um i'm just sort of trying to be honest about how this would happen where i am um and i i don't know that they would get away without an ercp so I think that everyone is making a, a, some really good points. You know, what is this next step? Now, the likelihood is, is that this patient is going to end up in the operating room. But the question really is, is what needs to be done to get to the OR? And should we, should we, you know, do a spyglass? Should we, should we evaluate her bile ducts further? Um, and, you know, this is where I wish that I had actually asked the question, a polling question on Zoom to see what the <laughs> panelists would do. Just, um, uh, Dr. Pasco, uh, did you have a comment? No, I think the other thing that we have to keep in mind is that this is a 69-year-old woman. Um, and I think that uh, that's something that I have to, I always have to keep in mind. This is not a 23-year-old and... Um, I do think that the spyglass may add something, you know, if I saw something that was up the left duct, then that may change the way I think very differently about this case. But um, I think in my heart, I already know what I'm going to do. And so I, <laughs> you know, if only if I saw that there was a cancer, would I think you would have to really twist my arm to take off that left side of the liver. And I think I probably would just do if this was there was no cancer, I'd probably just do a Roux and Y. Um, hepaticojejunostomy and leave the left side because um, I think she's 69 years old and you know that that's kind of what I would that that's why I feel the spyglass adds something. Yeah, I, I um. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yes, no, go ahead, please, Dr. Zuckerman. So you know that I agree with Sharona. First off, that 69 is not so old as I. It's not so far away. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, so the part of this, the whole part of this story that bugs me is how was this not picked up four years ago when she got worked up for her gallbladder? So th that's the only part that doesn't fit, right? Like she should have, this should have been the same story four years ago. This is not a new problem unless it's a surgical complication, which I don't think it is. So that's that's sort of what's driving my I want a little bit more information thing. But, you know, if if ERCP were unavailable, I don't think it would change what I was doing. So, 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 Randy, I do have to say that I have a series of patients that have either not wanted intervention and these things progress over time. And they also seem to go into the left hepatic duct more than the yep. right, for whatever reason. And I don't know what it is, but that's kind of my personal anecdotal experience. So I'm just wondering if it was a little bit, you know, probably yeah. you know, eight millimeters right. at the time of the previous thing. Yeah. yeah and, and, I I, and I think that the fact that she's she's 69 years old is a major is a major consideration. If this is clear, if this is a cholidocal cyst as opposed to a, a complication of, of, of her previous operation, which I think is why, why Dr. Zuckerman wants more information, right? Um, is, you know, evaluating her to see if she does have evidence of malignancy. Dr. Simo. I was just gonna say, you know, I think that for me, it really is, you know, the approach to, you take it to the OR and to just, you know, straight up resect it. Resect it. I think if there was no left duct dilation, I would feel more comfortable about um, just doing that. Right. Great. Any other uh, comments? Um, so, 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 so she went, underwent um, ERCP and um, no stones are found. It really didn't add too much. She did to the, the MRCP that she, she had done. Um, a spyglass was not performed, not available. Um, and so she came to, she came in for consultation and we talked about surgery. So Dr. Zuckerman, 
what what type of um, if we're proposing an operation with her, um, what would your what would your plan be? So um, my plan would be uh, Rue and Y hepatico jejunostomy. I would take her as high as I could while doing a single anastomosis. Um, I would freeze that proximal margin. Um, I would likely accept a little bit of dysplasia in the left duct and still sort of go on. Um, and I would take her as low, I would take the duct where it inserts into the pancreas. However, I would also, you know, let's imagine this patient was asymptomatic. Um, I, I would have the conversation that you're 69 and you don't have cancer yet. Um, and I, I actually, my personal feeling is that the risk of cancer in these is likely overestimated in the literature. Um, mm -hmm. And so in a truly asymptomatic patient who's, who's surgery adverse, I, I don't twist their arm. Well, if this is truly a cholidocal cyst, she's had it for a long time, right? Correct. Correct. And, she, and so, you know, so that's, that's my point. You know, yeah, if she was very 30, good. if she was 30, you know, I would really, um, I would twist her arm hard to have something done. But given the fact that she's symptomatic, it makes life a little bit easier. Ellen, we have about three or four minutes left, so I just want to make sure that we go to the uh, key points here. Okay, all right. Oh, um, this is amazing. Um, Dr. J. Raja, do you want to make any comments? Um, well, I just want to say a couple of things. So the biggest colloidal cyst I've dealt with was about 16 centimeters in a youngish woman, and it sort of splayed the pancreatic head in two. And I think the one key issue is it's very, very rare that we should be thinking about a Whipple in a colloidal cyst, if ever. So please, you know, especially for the trainees, please remember that um, you should be able to kind of core it out of the head of the pancreas. The other thing is that you've got a high insertion of the pancreatic duct in 60% of these patients. And that's a really useful tool in telling that it's a colloidal cyst, because if that is truly present, then it's fairly pathognomonic for a colloidal cyst. So that's helpful. Um, but I just wanted to make those two points. And Ellen, could you walk us through your beautiful video over here? I, you know, I, it's it's not a show and tell, but I just wanted to show people the pathology. And um, so she she underwent a, a robotic resection. I actually wanted to ask Dr. Simo her I, her uh, opinion yes. about laparoscopic versus robotic versus open. Um, thoughts about that? Yes, I would do it uh, robotic every day unless the patient's uh, comorbidities don't allow it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's yeah, so, uh, really nice recovery. Yeah, absolutely. And so here's the, here's the the cyst. Here's the hepatic artery, which of course got in our way. And this is a, a very long cystic duct remnant, which you saw um, on her MRCP. And we went down as uh, as far as we could go using a little ICG. And I'll just speed this up in the interest of time. It's portal vein back there, obviously. And um, just showing just the very distal extent, you know, transecting that. And then she had a, a, a hepatogogenginostomy, which quite frankly it is probably the most, uh, most um, challenging part of the, of the case. It's not necessarily the biliary um, dissection. Her pathology post-op did show that it was, a col it was consistent with a colidocal cyst. And um, there was no evidence of dysplasia. So to your point, uh, Dr. Zuckerman, you know, could she, if she were asymptomatic, just observing her. And so, so here you see the, her bifurcation and you see that it did not extend, it extended just to the hilum, um, did not go into the right or to the left. Uh, my last point over here, just to ask the group, uh, Jen, how do you follow these patients? Because, you know, this is a pan bile duct issue, right? So they're still at higher risk for intrahepatic disease. How do you follow them? Because it's it's really challenging, right? It's a really good question. I, um, you know, I, there, I don't think that there's any data to support this, but I typically like to see my patients, you know, <laughs> people who have good outcomes usually you like and to. I, we love so to talk to I do an MRI every year just to make sure that there's nothing that I'm missing um, in a comprehensive panel. Perfect. Um, uh, 
Ellen, love the comments about how beautiful your dissection was on that case. Uh, oh, yeah. Beautiful. I do have to say for me, I've stopped using VLOC on my biliary anastomoses because I actually have had like two or three strictures now. So I'm freaked out about that because it's pretty unusual to have a stricture post, uh, you know, HJ for a Whipple, for example. And so I've moved like you to a monocryl or some sort of monofilament here uh, that I'm very careful about now. Yeah. Um, but I, I never, I mean, I've rarely had you know, strictures with, with Whipples and open. And so it was really shocking to me when I had them robotically. Um, yeah. So I bring that up, although I'm not anywhere as good as this robotically, but- Very, um, very good, very good point. I'd love to hear Dr. Simo's uh, thoughts about that either now or even, you know, um, offline, um, but great. Yeah. Um, well, we do need to finish up. I promised Tim yeah. that we finish up on time. Uh, Dr. Pollock, I'm one minute over, but I think that this was fantastic. I just really want to thank all of our panelists. And I want to thank Medtronic again for their sponsorship of this event. Um, we really appreciate what you do for us and for, uh, for this educational effort. I want to thank all of our panelists and the chats that occurred during this. Uh, please reach out to me if there's anything I can do for anyone. Uh, again, I'm not an important person, but I'm passionate about doing, you know, just teaching and just helping in any way I can. I'm so proud of all of our trainees. I do want to say that a lot of our panelists today are graduates from AHPBA, HPB sponsored fellowships. And this is amazing. Uh, we're so proud of all of you for what you're doing. I want to do a, have a shout out for the fact that all of us in whatever environment that we're in, thank you, Tim, for making us feel valued. We appreciate that. And thank you so much for, for allowing us to do that. Dr. Pollock, do you have any last uh, points or, or comments? If I do. I do. I uh, similarly just want to um, thank you and thank everyone for a really great evening. Um, the cases were phenomenal. Um, always, uh, always learning. Uh, learning. We have so much to learn from one another, and that's one of the great things I think about HPB surgery is the interface between science, data, and expert opinion, which we uh, need all of those things to really inform how we care for our patients. So we've been blessed to have all of you as experts tonight. So I want to thank you. I similarly want to echo our gratitude um, on behalf of the AHPBA to Medtronic for being so generous in sponsoring this webinar tonight. And then finally, I'd like to thank all our participants for joining us tonight. I was extremely excited to see the large turnout. And I think that uh, clearly demonstrates the relevancy of our association. And I would strongly encourage all of you to look into becoming uh, full members of the AHPBA. And then finally, we look forward to our next webinar, which will have more of a transplant focus. So please be sure to be on the lookout for those announcements in the near future. So with that, I would like to conclude the night. I um, hope that all of you remain safe and remain well. And once again, uh, thank you. Good evening.